introduce uh, David Addison from Thermal Chemistry Limited, and he's going to be uh, sharing with us today's webinar, which is Industrial Boiler Water Treatment in Chemistry, Corrosion and Deposition Failures. So uh, we're going to be looking at uh, um, some of those challenges that you've probably uh, um, have been troubling you along the way. And just a reminder, the webinar today will be recorded. For those that uh, miss it, you'll be able to catch up on the Eco Business YouTube channel. And just a reminder, feel free to use the question portal that's there um, as part of the webinar um, login details for you. Fire those questions in and we'll address them as we go through the presentation. Um, so, you know, we welcome your, your feedback. So. Uh, and interaction. So without any further ado, we're going to uh, to get underway and uh, we'll um, hand the time over to David. All yours, David. All right. Okay. Good morning, everybody, from a very wet and horrible, miserable Waikato morning here up at the university. So um, let me just start clicking through. So we're going to run through a few things today. Well, it's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of refresh on my earlier seminar that I did on industrial boiler chemistry just to set the scene. So we'll go through a little bit cycle chemistry, water tube, fire tube boilers, what is corrosion, what is deposition. And then what I've done is out of some of my training stuff that I do for big utilities, we sort of pulled out the, the most relevant sort of issues that we see in industrial boilers around the world. So we'll talk about corrosion fatigue, pitting, overheating, um, fireside corrosion, um, flow accelerated corrosion, a little bit on steam turbines is, you know, what, what happens in a big turbine is the same that happens in a little turbine, and then a little bit on um, failure mechanism determination, which is quite important as well. So this is a very brief introduction to the subject. Um, it's, it's very complex and multifaceted, um, and every plant is, is unique to some degree, and, um, you know, what happens in one doesn't necessarily happen in another, but there is a high degree of commonality there. Um, and, and if you've been in the industry a while, there's a lot of different advice, and some of that is just people's experiences perhaps not lining up with um, what's actually going on. Some of it is uh, if someone's selling you perhaps a chemical product and something happens, it's, uh, there's a bit of a vested interest to deny that that product may have had anything to do with the failure and things like that. Um, so you just, you know, just make sure that uh, we ask the right questions. And if you, if this sort of tickles your fancy in any way, there's there's a lot of extra information out there that you can get. And if you want a bit more on some of these things that we've talked about, there's a lot of publications and papers and a lot of publicly available information. So just contact me and I can bounce some of that onto you. All right. So. Just quickly, we've, we've seen these ones in the last seminar, but why cycle chemistry? This is the, the chemistry of water and steam in any kind of boiler. We, what, what we're trying to do is to try to prevent corrosion and deposition related failures. And these invariably end up with a, a, what we call a forced outage, where the plant is shut down and unable to produce steam or, or electricity or whatever, you know, um, or take a waste gas or something like that, and, and it's the, the feed system in the boiler or the heat recovery steam generator and steam path. So, you know, you want your plant to operate as and when when required, and you don't want it to be, um, you don't want any unplanned forced outages. You want to be able to plan your outage around your, around your process and, and have it shut down when you want it to be shut down, not when you don't want it. And just a, a quick Refresher here. Most most common industrial boilers that we see around are what we call the Foster Wheeler D-type, built under license by um, uh, multiple suppliers in New Zealand and overseas. So it's uh, it's just a, a fairly standard boiler that may or may not have a superheater, but they always have an economizer. They'll have an evaporator type section. Um, they'll have a steam drum, uh, top and a bottom drum for distribution and, and a variety of equipment hanging off it. Um, gas fired or oil fired predominantly. Um, that's another shot of one there, just with its insulated casing on, and you know you you would have a have a fire. Um, just to make sure this mouse is on here. Um, fire, the heat comes through, feed water comes in, um, possibly an economizer out here as well, and then via convection, the water heats up, starts to boil, rises up, and then you have a steam drum here, it separates out the water steam, and then you would have a superheater if you had a superheater, and then and away you go. So they're pretty. Um, pretty standard sort of things, and there's a there's another shot there, um, derived originally from steam trains, um, and you know they've been around. This type of design's been around 100 plus years. Um, the other most common type is what we call a water tube boiler. So just just back on this one, this is a um, 
sorry, this is a, it's actually the wrong way around, that's a mistake on the last slide. This is a, the water is in the tube and the fire is outside the tube, and this one actually should be a, a fire tube boiler, so sorry about that, I let that typo come through. So this is the type of design which is smaller and lower pressure where um, the water is basically in the tank, and there's a firebox at the end, and then the, the hot gases are flowing through, and then the water is boiling and then being separated out. Um, again, very similar to steam train, well originally developed for steam trains back um, back at the dawn of the industrial age. So that's another another shot of one there, and um, you know basically this is the difference between a water tube and a fire tube. In terms of chemistry and corrosion, there you know most of the issues are the same. It's just that um, fire tube boilers tend to be lower pressure and they don't have superheaters on them. Um, any bigger boiler, um, anything, once you get to a certain size, you find the efficiency of the water tube boiler is higher, so therefore that's, that's where it goes. Um, so the difference is water tube, um, saturated or superheated steam can be sort of around low pressure down to 10 bar up to 180 pressure for, for subcritical. Once we get above that, we go into supercriticals, which is beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, if they've got superheated steam on them, then superheater corrosion and deposition control is pretty critical. Fire tube, they, they only produce saturated steam. They tend to be low, sort of around 10 bar, maybe one, two, three bar boilers, and less mechanically complex than a water tube boiler. And you know, organisations like Fonterra have a have a good mixture of um, fire tube and water tube boilers um, across their plants. Often, um, some of the sites have both um, in the same boiler house. They'll have a couple of fire tubes and then a, a few water tubes. So, what is what is corrosion? Um, it's the uh, you know, wearing away of material uh, metals due to a chemical reaction. So it's the the alloy or the you know the, the metal trying to turn back into what it came out of the ground as. You know, trying to turn back into an oxide. Um, you know, due to reaction with its surroundings. It's you know it's an electrochemical process. Um, normally an oxidant such as oxygen, and and this leads to failure because when it does that, it loses mechanical strength and and its mechanical properties. What is deposition? Um, deposition is a, it's a transport of material onto a surface. Okay, and and you know this is it could have suspended solids and water and steam onto another surface, or it could be a precipitation reaction. So you know you may have um, iron oxides come through as particulates in your in your water, and when the water boils within a boiler, it, that the steam leaves and the solid deposit remains behind. Um, or as, as you um, exceed your solubility limits for things like calcium and magnesium and, and silica, um, as you boil off the water, so it's just a, you know, it's just a solubility chemistry problem there, um, you'll get a, a deposit remaining. And, and what's the issue with that? Well, you know, the main one in industrial boilers is that it affects heat transfer. Things like silica are very good thermal insulators. And what happens is you, um, uh, you can't take the heat away from the from the fire side, and eventually that tube now becomes too warm, um, becomes too hot, and and that affects its microstructure, and you basically get a creep fatigue um, failure. Um, deposits, if you've got a steam turbine, that can that can impact on efficiency and things like that as well. Or if you are using steam in a in a heat transfer process, if you have precipitation or deposits out in your process equipment, you can do things like block up valves, um, block restrictions on the line, or and again, that affects the overall efficiency of the process. So boiler tube failures, it's a, it's a major problem for any conventional plant, we talked about this already, results in a forced outage and, and sometimes a difficult repair. If anyone's ever had to climb inside a boiler to, you know, it's almost Murphy's Law that the, the failure will be in the most awkward to reach tube in the bundle and you know the welders hanging upside down trying to cut and weld with a mirror and things like that. Um, so you know so there's there's a time and cost it's not you can't just switch it off and go in there and um, pull something out and put it back in. Normally any out any failure will result in a, a minimum of a few days outage. In, in boilers failures tend to be chemistry driven and, and we want to avoid uh, if at all possible. So into the actual failures here we're going to talk through each one of these for Corrosion fatigue, pitting, deposition and overheating, fireside corrosion, folicide corrosion, and steam turbines. And I'll illustrate it with this little schematic of the Foster Wheeler D-type, and and this will show 
where the, the problems are. So things like pitting can affect the whole boiler. Um, things like corrosion fatigue can affect the whole boiler. Overheating um, tends to be in the, in the primary evaporator locations. Corrosion fatigue tends to be more in the economizer. Um, FAC will tend to be more in the economizer. So we'll, we'll use that, that schematic as a guide to, to kind of guide us through. Because not everything happens everywhere. Um, and once you understand that, it can kind of help with the identification of what the problems are. Now, unfortunately, I started with the most tricky one, corrosion fatigue, so there's a little bit more chemistry here. and We'll skip through this, but it'll give you a bit of extra reading now. What is corrosion fatigue? Um, it's, a, it's a cracking failure that occurs in, in boilers, and very commonly misidentified as being thermal fatigue. Everybody, a lot of people look at this and say, oh, it's, it's due to thermal cycling, it's a thermal fatigue. But what basically happens is in corrosion fatigue, there's a thermal component, there's a cycling that goes on, uh, might be stop starts or ramp up and down and loads, but there's a corrosion component to it that means that the time to failure is a lot less than if it was a pure thermal fatigue type failure, okay? So what happens is you, you, you get a crack initiates and you get a bit of growth during the transient um, and it affects things where there's maybe a restraint on the boiler where the tube's welded onto something else and it's, it's got some movement restraint, thermal expansion, things like that, um, particularly during you know, cold starts or if you're doing a, what we call a force cool, you're trying to cool it down quickly to do maintenance work on it. Um, but then we find that then it's, if you've got, say, swings in pH or swings in your water chemistry, that, that helps to force that crack to grow even faster. And it's to do with oxide that's forming in the crack and then kind of it's like putting a chisel into the crack. You get a bit of oxide form and then break up and then reform because of the chemistry component. And then that drives that crack and keeps it moving through. So normally in industrial boilers, the, the main thing is low pH and pH swings, okay? Um, if you're swinging your pH around at the same time as your, your thermally cycling, you're going up and down in temperature, then you can expect to see corrosion fatigue failures as well. So what do they, what do they look like? Um, you know, you get these, these types of cracks that, that ultimately they grow from the, um, normally from the inside out. And here you can see the cracks initiated, and then you've got oxide in the crack. That oxide is the chemistry component is breaking up and, and reforming that oxide, which helps then drive the crack through. Um, types of locations where we see it, you know, here we've got a, um, some mesh mounting, um, and we've got like a, a mounting bar that's holding this, this, this mesh in to help direct gas flow, or um, and this is a little, I think a little coal-fired boiler, um, it's direct ash, and that's been welded onto there, and that's imposing uh, an additional stress on those tubes. And combined with a bit of bad water chemistry, then you would you can see you'll get cracks potentially form along here, and in that case, that would be corrosion fatigue. Um, so basically, it's that breakdown of the particular magnetite oxide. Um, you know, when the imposed strain is greater than the fracture strain of the oxide, the oxide will crack. That lets more water or um, to come into contact with the tube surface causing more magnetite to grow because that's a, it's a, it's a reaction that just wants to take place. Um, and then, you know, oxide then stays there and then you get another cycle and it cracks and away it goes again. Most of the time in industrial boilers, what we see, people say it's a thermal fatigue crack and um, when you look at it under the microscope, you'd say actually it's corrosion fatigue. So it's very commonly misidentified. So when we get to the end, we'll talk about um, mechanism identification and things like that, but if you're having cracks that keep happening in your boiler, I would strongly suggest that you send the tubes off to a metallurgist and, and try and identify the mechanism and you may find that that actually uh, gives you some more information to say maybe we need to change the chemistry a little bit or change the operating environment that we're in and you can actually stop those from happening again. So corrosion fatigue happens pretty much pretty much anywhere in a, in a, in a boiler, um, not in the superheaters, so it's, it's anywhere where there's water touch, so economizers and, and evaporator tubes. So what do we what do we recommend to how to minimize the risk? You know, do a full failure analysis to confirm mechanism of failure. From that, you can do a root cause analysis. So the mechanism of failure might be identified as corrosion fatigue, but the root cause might be that you've got 
uh, too many, you know, there's there's too much attachment stress plus there's a swing in pH and, and you're cycling the boiler up and down a load every day. Um, so there might be, that, that would be the root cause. And then implement actions to re avoid a repeat failure. This can be removing and changing the resistant stress locations, um, avoiding subcooling the natural circ boilers. You could alter the plant operating spaces if you can, optimize the cycle chemistry. And if you've ever done a chemical clean, don't use hydrochloric acid because um, the chloride can, um, it doesn't get rinsed out, that can drive things along. All right, next one is pitting. Uh, again, I apologize, a bit of electrochemistry here, but we'll, we'll try and, and get this as, as, as elegantly as possible. So basically, in a pit, you know, every, every metal surface, doesn't matter how perfect it is, it, it's got some irregularities on it, and that lets us form little anodic and cathodic sites. Um, and, and if you've got metal in contact with oxygen saturated water, okay, so we're not talking a few parts per billion, we're talking water that's in saturation with oxygen, so that's 9,000 ppb, okay, um, and under low pH then, then this reaction starts to go, metal is lost from the anode, and, um, you know, and what we get is Basically, you get this little reaction, and it just drives itself, and it keeps going, and we get these pits formed. Okay, um, and and the problem is, is the pits are autocatalytic. You know, once they start, the, the pit becomes a little party um, underneath here, and, and and away it goes. And if you've got things like chlorides and stuff like that there, it really, really goes. So, what happens is, you know, the pit forms. You get pitting on the surface. Over time, as you let these pits keep growing, eventually you'll get a through wall failure, and you'll get a pinhole leak on the outside. Um, that pinhole leak is the water or steam under pressure comes out, basically erodes away the rest of the tube, and the leak gets worse and worse and worse. And then you've got the other problem is you've got a you've now got a jet of water coming out of one tube that can be impacting onto an adjacent tube, and it works like a water blaster, and it can cut its way through. So. Um, how do we know when we've got pits? You know, we would look at them when you shut the boiler down and you have the, the classic blisters and you pop the blister and a bit of liquid and gunge comes out, corrosion products, and that's a pretty pretty good sign. So this, this image here um, is after the oxide's been removed and it shows the pits underneath here. If you think you've got pits, what, what's, can, you, can you detect them easily via, say, ultrasonic thickness testing and stuff like that? Well, no, UT doesn't pick pits up very well. UT will pick up material loss over a big general area. Normally, the first indication that you've got pitting-type corrosion occurring is that you get the pinhole failures. Um, really, the only way to pick up that you've got pits inside a, a tube or a pipe is uh, via X-ray radiography, which is um, expensive and, and complicated to do, and most people wouldn't really do a lot of that in industrial plants. Um, so, what's one of the things that we need to have with pits is we, we have to have moisture and we have to have oxygen. Um, so pitting predominantly occurs when boilers are shut down and they haven't been drained out properly. So they've either been shut down, they've cooled off, um, someone's opened up the drum doors or, you know, has, has water left sitting in the bottom of the headers. It, you get oxygen in there at saturation and it sits in and it's still, okay, there's no flow. As soon as you get a bit of flow over the surface, you disrupt that pitting potential and it's much more difficult for pits to form in a boiler that's actually in service where you've got circulation and flow going on. So when you shut down, you want the, you want the boiler to be fully dry. It means you've got to get all the water out. And what we find here, this thing called the Vernon curve, it's, a, it's quite useful, everyone should have this on the wall in their little plant control rooms. And what it says here is, as, as the humidity of the environment goes down in relation to carb, carbon steel or, or any kind of steel, the corrosion rate decreases massively. So if we know that if we can get the relative humidity on uh, around the metal surface below about 30%, basically all corrosion stops. So when we shut boilers down, and particularly if you have an operation where maybe you're shut down for a few months every year or a few weeks, what you should be doing is draining the boiler down fully, blowing it down hot, um, putting dehumidified air through it, um, and trying to evaporate out all the residual moisture and get the relative humidity down below 30%, and you won't have any pitting. pitting you stop all the pitting potential. If you half drain the boiler and let it sit there for a few months and 
go to start up and then are surprised why you suddenly had a failure. Um, that's that's what we call offline corrosion and, and pitting is what the problem is there. So um, pitting predominantly doesn't occur when you're in service. It's, it's an offline damage mechanism. And because of that, it pretty much can occur anywhere um, within the boiler. Um, steam path, drums, tubes, headers, feed water pipes, economizers, um, particularly when you shut down and you haven't you haven't drained everything out. So same same things as uh, the first three common ones. Uh, if you've had a failure, you do the failure analysis and you do the root cause. So you know the mechanism of failure will be pitting. Normally the root cause is improper layup and storage, um, you know, resulting in the conditions that allow pits to form. Um, so implementing actions to avoid repeat failures, you know, you, you control the oxygen levels during operation and shutdown, and it's predominantly during shutdown that we're most interested in. Um, and, and the easiest way to do that is if is basically get rid of the water. If there's no water, uh, no moisture, if we're below 30% relative humidity, then basically all corrosion stops. So ensuring full dry storage when shut down, and that might mean that you have to purchase um, uh, a portable dehumidification, industrial dehumidification unit, um, munters, munters dryers, quite common around the place. And what they are is you you circulate dry air into the boiler and, and take it back out the top and then that gets regenerated and, and around and around it goes and you dry out all the remaining moisture there. If you have to store wet, say you want to have the boiler wet and ready for rapid recall, then you really have to have some kind of offline fluid circulation to disrupt that pitting potential. And there are some applications where you may be able to apply coating, um, particularly to you know for, for piping and things like that, where you, you provide a barrier between the water in the metal, and this obviously doesn't work for boiler tubes, but it may work for, for condensate return pipe work and things like that, so that there's no interaction between the water and the metal, so you don't get that pitting potential um, able to go. Next one on the list is um, deposition and overheating, and, and this affects both water and steam tubes. Um, so what, what happens here is if... <sighs> If you can imagine it, your, your boiler is basically, a, it's a heat transfer device. Um, the, the, the fluid in the tubes is taking away the heat of the fire, um, whether it's coal, oil, or, or gas. But if you have a blockage in one of those tubes or some restriction um, in its ability to transfer the heat, what happens is that tube material now will heat up quite rapidly and it will approach the, the gas side temperature and that may exceed what we call the, the creep temperature of that material and basically at a, at a microstructural level it, it basically starts to melt. It's probably the best way to describe it. The microstructure starts to change, particularly in the, in the carbon steels, and when it starts to do that, it, it becomes weaker. You, you start to get voids forming in the material and then ultimately it can't hold the, the internal pressure anymore. And and, and as you can see here, you know, here's a, a superheater failure um, where the tube has become blocked and it's failed and it's had quite a lot of pressure of steam and it's managed to blow, as the steam's blowing out of the tube, it's actually managed to wrap itself around the bundle and do this quite amazing amount of damage. It's, it's like a giant has been inside this boiler and done that. So you get a lot of conse you know, consequential damage when you have these failures. And, and here's a, a classic... Um, what we call the fish mouth type failure where there's been a short term overheating and you get this almost sort of cartoon character kind of fish mouth um, and it's got a, when we look at under the electron microscope we'd see when the microstructure has changed and the, and the fracture face will, will show certain characteristics that we know as short term overheating. So you can get short term overheating as like say you're constructing a boiler or you're doing some major major repair work and someone's jammed a rag or something down a tube in the tube bundle and you've gone to start back up, you know, that immediately provides a blockage and that tube will, will fail pretty quickly. If we've got scale building up inside the tubes due to poor water chemistry, so say it's a plant that's uh, seawater cooled for the steam turbine condenser and you have a leak, you get you get a lot of seawater gets into the plant and basically you form you know, it evaporates and you get this sort of salt deposit and that's very insulating. Um, silica is the other big one. If you get a heavy silica deposit, silica is very thermally insulating. Um, tools and paper left behind, um, 
if you're cutting out tubes for whatever reason and rewelding them, the welders like to have plugged the tubes that they're welding so that it doesn't um, affect the purge gas flow. What they should always be doing is using a water soluble plug, um, normally rice paper, um, which is white, but sometimes a junior welder doesn't quite pick up this message from the um, from the senior welder and they get a load of uh, paper towels or toilet paper and they jam it down there and then when the boiler goes to start up that won't dissolve and you get a blockage from that. What you may also find is if you've had another failure um, which is venting steam, um, tubes downstream of that no longer have coolant flow and they'll fail as well. So you know and this, this can happen this can happen pretty quickly. You know, I've been on some projects where there's been construction issues and they fired the boiler up for the first time and within three to four hours we've had multiple short-term overheating failures um, and then gone and looked at them and said the, the tubes have been quite badly blocked and that's that's the reason for that. Um, where do these happen? Um, normally in the main evaporator circuit and if this, if this boiler had a you know um, superheater here it'll, it'll occur there as well. Um, not so much in economizers, it doesn't really happen there, but what, what do we need to do? Obviously full failure analysis, root cause, and the, the re implement actions to, report, uh, to avoid repeat failures include, you know, altering the operating chemistry to minimize scale buildup. Now if you've got heavy scale in your boiler and you'll say you're using a water softener, um, that's not really removing a lot of the material out of the, out of the makeup water, you might need to look at switching to a demineralizing plant, and of course that all depends on the operating pressures and temperatures and boiler design. So, but you know, you, you may be able to change the chemistry. You may be able to improve the water treatment. Um, if you have superheaters, a big cause of deposits in superheaters is what we call carryover. It's where the boiler water is being entrained in the steam and being carried into the superheater, where it then evaporates and, and leaves those dissolved ions behind. Um, you make sure that if anyone's inside the boiler doing any work, everything that goes in comes out. That's you know lunch boxes, welders, boiler inspectors, everybody like that. And you know very careful welding techniques. Now the good welders, yeah, they know all this stuff. But say you've uh, got an outage and you found a much cheaper welder that's never worked in a boiler before down the road, just be cautious there that they may not know some of these little tricks around um, welding some of these pressure parts. So. You know, you've got to make sure that if they're doing any purge gas blocking on, on when they're welding tubes that you ask the question, you say, is that rice paper? Um, that is going to be uh, soluble and will dissolve away. So yeah, always a few, few, few questions to ask. Next one is fire side corrosion. And this one is, is chemistry related, but it's actually got nothing to do with water and steam. Um, but it is something that is, is a common problem that we see. And, and this is corrosion of the gas fire side of the boiler. And it tends to be worse in the economizers, the colder end of the boiler. And, and what this is, is this is the chemistry of the fuel gas or the coal or the oil. And it's the formation of corrosive combustion uh, products, primarily sulfates, okay, that form sulfuric acid. So if, you, if you've got some cheap gas and it's got, you know, maybe what we call sour gas, which has very high sulfur component to it, when you combust that, it forms sulfur dioxide, that a little bit of that reacts and forms sulfur trioxide. Um, and then if you get any moisture forming, and particularly at the back end of the boiler, that, that flue gas is starting to condense and you start to get some liquid forming in the economizers and in the stacks and things like that, you can have a very, very low pH environment forming there now because of this, the, 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 the SO2 and the SO3 dissolves in and, and you'll get corrosion from the you know, outside in. Um, and there's been some reports where whole um, stacks, exhaust stacks have actually fallen off their bases because of this what we call acid dew point corrosion or fireside corrosion. You know, the condensation is, is pooling in the bottom and when you take a sample of that, pH is very, very low and it's just dissolving away the carbon steel that's um that's present there. So, you know, a little bit of chemistry here. Sulfur is the sulfur is the main troublemaker and um, you may have it as H2S, hydrogen sulfide, sour gas. Um, you may have odorant in your gas, and, and even though they add a small amount of these odorants, the, the, these mercaptans, butathiol or tetrahyothiophylline, um, these are odorants, even in very low concentrations, when you burn these, they form sulfur dioxide, and they will accumulate in the back end of the, in the, back end of the boiler, okay? So 
even if you have odorized gas, you, you need to be aware that you can get some fireside corrosion, okay? And, and also if you are close to the sea, if you're the air that gets brought in for combustion, it may have aerosols or sulfate present in there, okay? This is particularly a problem for coastal units, you know, boilers at, at you know, oil refineries that are next to the sea and things like that. This is a very common problem. Um, what happens is, is, you know, here's a little bit of data here, you know, you get deposits on the tubes. Um, we see when they've got fireside corrosion and we, we do an X-ray uh, diffraction analysis and we see lots of iron sulfates, um, things like that. As soon as I see this, this present, if any sulfates in any of these deposits that we pull off the tubes, um, we know you've got um, fireside corrosion issues. Okay, So this is a, a heat recovery steam generator um, tube here and it's got this yellowy white deposit all over it. Um, and you can see here is a photo of me scraping a sample off. You add a little bit of water to that, you know, it goes to pH 2. Um, these deposits tend to be very hydroscopic, you know, and you might shut the boiler down and you initially look in and you say, oh, it's got a bit of a deposit in there, that's okay. And you sit there for a couple of weeks and you go in and it's all become very oily and it's dripping down and that's because it's absorbed more moisture from the air and it's running around in there and it's just corroding out. Um, corroding around the tubes, it corrodes the liner plates, the floor plates, the the back ends of the stacks, everything. So you've got to be you've got to be very, very careful with this. Um, so gas side, predominantly at the back end, the, the temperatures up the temperatures up in here um, tend to be hot enough that you get no liquid layers forming um, inside the main combustion areas, but it's at the economizers um, and, and as you come out the exhaust duct to, to the stack that, that you'll get the liquid layers starting to form, the early condensation, and, and the pH will go very, very, very low. So again, what do we do? Full failure analysis, root cause, and then, you know, if, if, if you had the choice of, say, two different gases from a different gas supplier or a fuel oil supplier, you know, try and get the lowest sulfur containing fuel as possible, um, sometimes that's, you know, the price difference is, you know, normally the lower the sulfur content of the fuel, the more expensive it is. Um, when you shut down, you know, you want to actually have the gas side dry as well, and some plants will put, you know, um, heaters inside the furnace space to, to dry out any moisture that's there. You know, they'll, they may have a stack damper that they close the stack damper to stop rainwater getting in. Um, some plants, you know, what they may find is you may have to say, look, the, the economizer tubes, they only need to be carbon steel to hold the temperatures and pressures, but you may need to upgrade those to stainless steel or a much higher grade material to, to protect you from those low pH condensates that form on the, on the gas side, and that's commonly done. Or you may want to apply coatings um, to, the, to the liner plates and the insides of the stacks, and I've seen that done. High temperature epoxy coatings have been applied to protect the material. Now the only issue with a coating is a coating is only as good um, as it is perfect. So as soon as you get any damage to that coating, you will get material condensate will get underneath that and you, you may think that that coating looks perfectly fine, but then it's actually corroding out rapidly underneath it. So if you go down the coating path, you need to make sure that those coatings are checked and inspected and, and looked at very carefully. All right, next one on the list. Fly accelerator corrosion, um, again a little bit of chemistry here, sometimes people talk to this about, they refer to it as erosion corrosion, and I can assure you that there's no contribution from solid particles, and and what it is is in, in the temperature range of 80 to 220, which is, in, in some industrial boilers there would be some feed systems or condensate return that comes back like this, but normally this is actually in the economizers. Um, in the big conventional fossil power plants, this is what we'd call the feed water system. There'd be feed water heaters and things like that, or it may be your deaerator temperature if you have a thermal DA. But what it is, is it's a, it's a dissolution corrosion mechanism that occurs in carbon steel, and it's the, the material starts to, it forms an oxide, that oxide dissolves, it reforms, it dissolves, and the material thins from the inside out. And it, it's the basically stability, instability of the iron oxide layer, and it's made worse by incorrect chemistry. Um, and, and this is just what happens, this is your carbon steel, and you put it into, 
into, into boiler water at temperature and it wants to form magnetite, which is Fe3O4. And FAC is a process where we dissolve off some of that Fe3O4, we re-expose the parent metal and it wants to form the oxide. And every time it wants to reform that oxide, it takes an atom of iron from the, from the carbon steel, forms this oxide, and then over time that material thins away. Um, heavily influenced by temperature. So here we have a, basically this is the single phase FAC curve and it's influenced by pH. So as the temperature increases from 50 up to 350 and here these lines here reflect different pHs. So this is pH 8.7, this is pH 9.6. The pH is, is it get to the low side. What happens is as we hit this peak of 150 degrees C that iron solubility goes right up, that magnetite solubility goes right up. We can suppress that solubility by increasing the pH and we come down here and that's got a much lower corrosion rate. And, and these figures here relate to basically a combined cycle plant. But if you have a, a lot of industrial boilers, you know, the slightly bigger Foster Wheeler D-types, this would be perhaps the economizer outlet um, sort of area. So you, what you find is you may get some failures in those areas and that, that could be FAC. Um, particularly if you're running low pH. So um, how do we control it? If you've got a little bit of chromium in your material, um, it basically becomes resistance to chrome forms, uh, the chrome in the material forms, you get chromium oxide forms as part of the protective oxide and that's very resistant. We want to run at a pH 9.5 to 10 and this is going to be a bit strange, but you actually a little bit of oxygen helps prevent FAC. So oxygen in industrial boilers is your, your friend and your enemy. If it's too high and it's stagnant, you'll get pitting. Um, if the boiler's in service and you actually don't have enough oxygen, it can actually make FAC a little, uh, make FAC worse. So this is a bit of a bit of a head change from the old steam train days where it was any oxygen is bad and we want to get rid of it all, and you may find that anyone your chemical vendors will swear black and blue that you need to get rid of all the oxygen, but that's normally because they're selling you a bit of um, oxygen scavenging chemical, which is uh, quite lucrative. But for most boilers, you you know you actually want a couple of ppb of oxygen, and it helps to prevent FAC. Um, there's a second type, which is two phase. Uh, it's just where we have a water steam mixture, same kind of um, same kind of mechanism. Um, you know, if you want to know more about this, it's a very complex area of chemistry. But if you have these type, if you're having failures, say in your economizer outlet and things like that, when you look at it under the microscope, we can see straight away it's FAC and the, and the fixes. You know, we adjust the chemistry, um, we may change the operating space a little bit or change the materials, and we can normally fix the problem and take it away. So FAC for these types of boilers is normally the economizer. Why doesn't it doesn't it occur in the evaporators? What happens is as you get up higher in temperature, magnetite undergoes a bit of a solubility change, the crystal structure changes a little bit, and as you go higher and higher in temperature, up above about 250, becomes more and more insoluble under the same conditions, um, and FAC becomes less and less of a problem. It's, it's at, at around 150 Celsius is the, is, the, is the danger zone. So what do we do there? Um, obviously, if you have a failure, full, full failure analysis, root cause and then what we want to try and do is if you can keep your feed water and boiler pH 9.8 or higher that, that helps a lot, that drives us down that, that curve. You need to consider the use of oxygen scavengers carefully and you know there's, there's, there's quite a complex set of questions that you need to go through there. You know, I'm not telling you what to do right now and every boiler is a little bit different but if you are using oxygen scavenger and you have any FAC failures then you probably to have a bit of a think about what are you doing everything right there and sometimes we do find that you can't change the chemistry enough to, to fix the problem so you say hey look we're going to have to replace these tubes and then you may want to say well we, we, we change to a higher chromium content material you go instead of being carbon steel you go to what we call P11 or P22 which is one and a quarter and two and a quarter chrome material and then we armor up the boiler and that provides additional protection and and you shouldn't have another failure again after that. So you know it's there's 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 always a solution. Um, and just a, a quick one on steam turbines. There's a few few plants out there that have little steam turbines. You know one or two megawatt type units. Um, sorry, uh, 
jumping around here. Whoops, there we go. Steam purity. So if you've got impurities in your steam, these will lead to deposits on the steam turbine, okay? And similar sort of thing, if you have, say, sodium chloride or sodium hydroxide come out of the boiler and deposit on the turbine, during the shutdown periods, when the turbine shut down and it's no longer at steam conditions or you've lifted the lid on it, you'll get oxygen and you get moisture and the same mechanism relating to pitting will occur that happens in the boiler tube. So you get pitting on the turbines. Um, the problem with pitting is, you know, eventually the pit will get deep enough that the, you may get a component failure on its own. But what happens in steam turbines in particular is once you have a pit on a surface, you've got a stress concentrator. And when that steam turbine starts back up, you'll get a crack that forms off that. So corrosion fatigue is one mechanism, and another one is called stress corrosion cracking. And what you can get is, because that turbine will be sitting there spinning at, you know, normally in New Zealand it'll be 3,000 RPM, it's quite a lot of energy there, and you have a crack that's forming, eventually um, that component may shear off and do a whole bunch of damage as it bangs around inside the casing and may sometimes actually exit the casing and you'll have a steam explosions. But the second problem with deposits is, you know, you get a deposit forming inside the turbine, it can actually increase, the, you know, decrease the efficiency of the steam as it goes through so that you don't get as much energy transfer onto the blade so the efficiency of the turbine goes down or you'll get a back pressure situation in the turbine where you just can't get the power out of the turbine that you wanted and silica is particularly bad at that, it precipitates onto the blade surfaces in the, what we call the phase transition zone. Um, where the steam goes from superheat down to, to saturated and it grows and you get this crystal and it disrupts the steam flow and, and the power of you know the efficiency of the turbine drops down. And then we talked a little bit about that, you know, if you've got pits and you'll get higher risk of crack formation. And if anyone's ever been involved in repairing a turbine, boilers are very cheap to repair, turbines are very, very expensive to repair and um, you know we don't really want to have turbine repairs if we can avoid them. Um, and here's a, here's a steam turbine that I prepared earlier for you. Um, you know, this is the colour that it should be, and it's had a bit of a major chemistry upset. And, and what happens here is because the pressure changes through the turbine, this is the high pressure end, um, and the pressure drop goes down, and solubility chemistry is all driven by pressure. Different components of that contamination have precipitated out as you go down. So this is a bit of oxide deposition on the turbine. You know, and then we've got... Um, Sodium hydroxide, sodium chloride, and silica all coming out here as a sort of this as a colour changes along here, and that's um, that turbines, that particular turbines at risk of um, you know it's got an efficiency loss because of those deposits on those blades, and then if those if that turbine is stored in an environment where there's moisture um, and oxygen, then you'll get pitting, which will then ultimately result in, in mechanical failure of the turbine and, and the associated repair. And what do those sort of ones look like? You know, here's a, a, a biggish turbine, but it's missing a blade here. It's decided to go on holiday, and you can see the damage that it's done to the adjacent blades as it's banged around in there as the turbine spun down. Um, normally, the turbine will trip on vibrations, so it's, we, we don't want we don't want any of those things to happen. And, you know, there's there's a you know interrelationship between various damage mechanisms that you know it goes on and, and and all these things for both boilers and turbines where you know we have a material you know what's its composition heat treatment microstructure surface condition the environment you know composition of the environment and this could be the online environment and the offline environment you know um, and we have stress and strain you know and and, and corrosion, pure corrosion, is the combination of the material and the environment. You know, the material and the stress and strain, that'll give you pure fatigue. Um, combination of the environment and the stress and strain, that'll give you corrosion fatigue. And, and stress corrosion cracking sort of is the worst of everything. It sits in the middle there. But very unusual to get stress corrosion cracking failures in an industrial boiler unless you've got a, a small industrial turbine. Um, or you, you may have a, a higher pressure than normal um, superheater. So for, for any kind of um, fire tube boiler, this would pretty much never happen. If you've had a failure, what do you do? Well, what you should be doing is you should be taking a tube out, and, and really it should go to a, a reputable and experienced metallurgical laboratory. 
and by this I don't mean you stand there and you everyone stands around and looks at it on the bench and everyone goes well I think this is what it is I think this is what it is you you want to send it to the lab you want to what they do is they'll cross section it they will um, slice it up put it under the electron microscope we'll look at the microstructure and then you can tell straight away you can say right it's got pits on the surface and then it's had a crack initiated off that or it's had a microstructural change which is consistent with overheating. Lots of these failures you know to the naked eye look very similar and what happens is people think they know what the problem is and they take a certain action that is wrong you know and it doesn't stop a repeat failure situation from occurring so I would encourage you all to, you know, for a few thousand dollars to, to send it to a metallurgical lab. Um, ones in New Zealand, uh, Quest down in Lower Hutt do this. Uh, Canterbury University Mechanical Engineering Department does a pretty good job as well. Um, there's a number of different engineering consultancies up in Auckland that, that can do this as well. So, you know, if you do a quick Google search, you'll find someone. It's that you cut the tube out, you send it away, you do the mechanism. And then what we do is, you know, if you're having lots of failures or you've got a fleet of boilers that keep having the same failures, you really need to look at a, what we call a, a boiler tube failure reduction program, you know. And, and what this means is that you do this analysis of each time, each time there's a failure, you, you identify the root cause and you try and address that. And say you've got, you know, I mean, for companies like Fonterra, you have multiple boilers of the same design spread around your fleet, you know, and if what's happened on, on boiler on plant one, you know, or site one, there's a good chance it's probably going to happen on site two, and sometimes you can call your mate down the road, the, the ops manager down there, and say, hey, we've had this happen at our plant, um, you want to check this and this, and they do that, and they say, oh, that's really good, we, we managed to, to stop that problem before it resulted in a failure, and that, that's a very good thing to do. Um, and that you also, you want to make sure that the true cost of each boiler tube failure is, is understood across an organisation. Um, often we find when we look at plants that they have a very big maintenance budget because they're repairing things all the time, um, but they don't have a very big investigation budget. And we normally say, well, if we spend a bit more money on the investigation side of things, you know, the payback for that is we can address the root cause and then your maintenance budget will come down by a, a much bigger margin because that, that maintenance cost is very, very high. You know, every time you have to shut a boiler down, cool it down, sometimes you've got to build scaffold in there for access, time you cut out the tube, weld in a new tube, every time you do that there's a risk that the new weld's going to fail if, if there's an issue there or something like that. You know, where if you say, hey, look, if we maybe adjust the operating space or adjust the chemistry um, or we adjust the design or we change the repair next time to a, to a better material, then over time you find that that maintenance cost goes down, which is, which is, which is a really good thing. Um, if you want some additional information, um, I'd, I'd suggest that, you know, if you go have a look at the IAPS website, International Association for the Properties of Water and Steam, I'm, I'm involved in this and, and for New Zealand this is really good. And then if you go to the IAPS.org website and look at the tech guides, there's a whole bunch of guidelines around boilers and boiler chemistry and steam. And within those there's a whole bunch of really good references that you can you can dig out more material. Um, there's a really good journal called Power Plant Chemistry Journal that has a lot of information on not only industrial, you know, fossil boilers and nuclear plants and anything to do with steam and water, they also have a lot of information on industrial boilers um, and there's a lot of, lot of information there and, and obviously Google is your, is your friend as well. But if, if, anyone, if anybody wants a bit more information on one of these failure mechanisms and things like that, I've got various papers and publications on things that I'd, I'd be more than happy to share with you if you want. So you just um, drop me a line or, or look me up and, and we, can, we can help you out there. Um, We've got time for questions, but I guess where to from here um, is the next next webinar is 13th of July um, with uh, James Neal, Compressor Size Selection, Managing the Anxiety Factors. That, that sounds quite intriguing. I get quite anxious around air compressors, so there, there we go, because they make funny noises and I'm a chemist, so I don't really know much about that. Um, so I might have to sit in on that one. And the 27th of July seminar is still to be confirmed, but I'm sure the, the guys here at, at the University of Waikato um, we'll, we'll send out something on that, um, and then that's the uh, EECA 
this program information. So we've got a little bit of time. Um, if there's any any questions, um, happy to happy to chat or do my best to answer. I know this has been a bit of a machine gun session with um, uh, information. So but hopefully it's a bit of a taste to, to tr tickle your fancy. But looks like we do have a question here. All right, so let me let me have a read of this one. So this is from Mike Seville. Um, not totally related to this webinar, however, we have severe buildup in a steam pipe just after the control valve. Upstream pressure is 11.5 bar. Downstream, we've just deposition is due to pressure about one bar. Due to this, the steam has some superheat. Top of the pipe, 60. Okay, yep, you've you've pretty much almost answered your question there. You've got such an aggressive pressure drop that you are. What's happening is. You've obviously got saturated steam coming in, and then when you superheat, um, it, because that pressure drop is so high, you, you, you've got superheat going on. Um, and what's happening is the you have some contaminants in the water phase in that super in that saturated steam. There'll be contamination in the, in the, in the water droplets, so probably some silica. Um, would be most likely being New Zealand. We have an unfortunate and high amount of silica in a lot of our waters. Um, and what will be happening is it'll be flashing the superheat, um, and that's basically allowing that silica to then um, it basically precipitates out. And the top of the pipe will well, that's just be the location where it's that's just where it's, it's where it's occurring. So. I would almost guarantee it would be a, a silica. Um, it would be to do with the purity of that saturated steam um, upstream of that control valve. Um, take a sample and send it to a company called Spectrochem or Spectrochem down in Lower Hutt and ask for an XR X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence analysis. So what they'll do there is you normally send them 10 or 15 grams of material, they grind it up into a powder, um, and X-ray fluorescence will give us a, give you a chemical analysis of, of the elements, and X-ray diffraction will give you what the crystal structure is. So, you know, it will probably be sodium silicate, would be most, most likely. Um, there'd probably be a little bit of iron and maybe a little bit of chloride and hydroxide in there as well, depending on your water chemistry. And um, that'll give you some good information. And then what you probably, in terms of the root cause, what can you do? Um, well, first thing I'd do is look at the purity of that, that, that saturated steam and say, can you um, improve on that? Is it carry over from the boiler? And then look at not such an aggressive um, pressure drop. So you might look at wanting to multi-stage that pressure drop to minimise that flash to superheat. And, um, or you may need to look at doing a little bit of a temperation spraying before you, you go down so you don't cross over that line so you stay saturated all the way through the process. So um, hopefully that helps, Mike. So any other questions? So well, um, yeah. So if you got if people, um, you know, if you if you've got any questions afterwards, um, my my details are on the on the on the um, on the first page of the slide, or you can just Google search thermal chemistry and, and you'll find my website, which has got my contact details and there's a I've got a bunch of inf additional information. Some of this information is out of um, some quite long training modules that I do for various utilities around the world so I've just sort of pulled out various bits and pieces for this and, and I do apologize for the chemistry aspect of it but um, and it's in the in the briefness of it but hopefully it's uh, given you some things to think about anything else James I'll oh, just uh... Hopefully that's uh, unmutable. Yeah, so uh, thanks very much, Dave, for, for joining us. We'll give you guys a, a minute or two more if you want to fire through any questions. But, uh, yeah, just behalf on you all, thanks very much, Dave, for, for coming in. Um, certainly a topic of some interest. Um, 
and, and so yeah, just a reminder that obviously the, the webinar has been recorded and will be available. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions coming in um, here, Dave. So yeah. the first one here is low temperature hot water systems. If we have a steel boiler connected with copper pipework downstream, is there an issue with copper ions from the pipework depositing on the internal tubes and causing corrosion? There's, there's always a potential for, uh, if you've got some corrosion of that copper pipework, to get some copper transport back. In terms of does copper ions on side a boiler tube um, cause any kind of particular corrosion, the answer is no. Um, the copper just forms a deposit, this becomes part of the deposit. Um, if it's really, really bad, eventually you can get some overheating type issues, things like that. Um, you know, but there's no electrochemical type galvanic corrosion type mechanism that will occur there. The copper just ends up being present in the deposit from what we call corrosion product return um, there. But what you tend to find with the hot water systems, the you know that 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 copper pipe work is is relatively inert. Um, you know, but it's it's when you get to much high pressure. I mean, I'm not sure what your pressure is, but hot hot water. I'm assuming it's you know maybe a bar pressure of, of that. Um, but no, the answer is doesn't normally cause you any problems in the boiler itself. If you had a steam turbine, however, that's a different kettle of fish because copper is very volatile in steam, particularly superheated steam. So copper, if you had a steam turbine and you had copper corrosion products coming back it's very, very likely that the copper, the higher the pressure, the more the copper goes into the steam and then the copper tends to plate out inside the turbine and you get very significant um, efficiency losses in turbines. But this is more of a problem for big fossil plants. Um, but it's not, won't really be so much of an issue for little industrial plants. So I hope that, hope that helps, Deepak. You wouldn't use copper tubes in a big application like that, would no, you? Really? No, no. We basically, for the last 20 years, we've specifically excluded copper from all modern power plant designs because of the the, the issue with copper and carbon steel in a boiler is that the optimum pH. We talked about this for carbon steel is about 9.8 to 10. That minimises the corrosion of carbon steel. Unfortunately, for copper, it's about 8.4. So you, you have these two, what we call these porabax curves that don't match up. So if you had the optimised chemistry for the carbon steel, we would have very rapid co uh, copper corrosion occurring. And then if we optimise the corrosion control for copper within a boiler feed water system, we would have very rapid carbon steel corrosion. So we, we try to... Basically, if we were building a new power station today, one of the lines that I'd write in the technical spec is no copper alloys are permitted anywhere in the system. Everything's built out of carbon steel or higher grade alloy steels or titanium now. Beautiful. Thank you, Dave. All right. So, um, no, that's that's great. Thank you, Deepak. Hope it looks like that's answered your question. Well, um, we've been online this long. We'll give you a minute or two more in case anyone's still got a question. Otherwise, we'll be looking to sign off shortly. In, in the event um, that you have a question but you can't type fast enough or you've got a rush, by all means feel free to forward any questions back through me if you like. Um, post the webinar, you'll get a reminder email thanking you for being here. Feel free to fly to myself there if, if there's anything that we can um, uh, do to assist and we can certainly help to look to point you in the right direction. So uh, I think uh, I think we'll probably wrap that up there, Dave. Yeah. Um, so no, thanks very much, everyone, and we'll uh, see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thanks for thanks for your time, guys, and uh, yeah, talk to you another time maybe. <laughs>